everyone. Welcome to Sonographers in the Cities. I'm Lynn. And I'm Giselle. And before we begin this episode, I just want to let you know that wherever you're listening to, um, please follow, subscribe, rate us, give us feedback, because we always love to hear what you think about um, our podcast, and we always want to improve for you. Yes, you guys, don't forget to um, comment what you guys want us to talk about. Um, and we are still in medical ultrasound awareness month today we have a really special video because it is our first guest and we have here molly she's a sonographer and she's gonna be here to tell you guys a little bit about ultrasound after being in the field for many years and she's also an educator so we wanted to bring her on here to speak on behalf of her experience yes thank you so much molly for coming on Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Excited to do this with you guys. So Molly, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience in sonography? Yeah, I've been a sonographer for about 10 years now. I am registered RDMS in abdomen, OB, and pediatrics, and then I also have my RVT. So I've been in clinic for about 10 years. I've been teaching for about five years, and it's been really exciting. It's been an awesome career so far. I'm so happy I made the rash decision to get into sonography school. When you say rash decision, so like how did you get into sonography? I was pregnant with my first child and of course I thought like well I can recognize things on the screen that's clearly an arm that's a face like I can do this this looks pretty easy and I also had heard the tech say something about she could get a check to go anywhere it seemed like a really in-demand field at the time as well I'm like that sounds awesome I could do it it's in need, I'm going to go do it. So I pretty much made the decision within a month and started school. I was so excited that I act, that I did it. But once I got into school, I was like, oh, this is so much more than babies. I had no idea. Now it turns out babies are like my least favorite thing to do. I love everything else but babies. Um, babies are still fun when moms and dads are engaged in the scan and it's we're having a good time and getting to show them all the cute things. But there's just so much more to it. And there's so much so much to learn. And it's just a really exciting career. I don't know. It, yeah, it was just like, I looked it up, found a school and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go do that. And there I, here I am <laughs> 10 years so later. Were you pregnant while you're in your program or is this, this is after having your child? I had a nine month old when I started uh, the school or the actual program. And then I had a child after. Yeah. So I was never pro, pro, uh, pregnant during the program. So how was your student experience having a nine month old? Because I noticed that I've had mothers in my program and like um, other um, mothers who are doing the same thing, like they want to start their careers. And how was it for you and other um, suggestions you might have for them? Well, I think my experience was a little unique because it was definitely coming back to school for a second time. So I'd already had the college experience. I had already gained some insight into what it means to be in college. And so for myself, it was very much, it it was easy to come back and do it. I already had a lot of that skill set built in. And even with a child at home, I had a very supportive family, which is definitely a must in ultrasound school because you're at school all day. A lot of times you're practicing at night. You got to basically work for free during your internship. So you do have to have that support outside of uh, your actual schooling part of it. You have to have outside support to make you successful as well. But it, it didn't hinder anything to have children. It just made me be a little bit more creative. You know, when I went to open labs, I went after she went to bed at seven o'clock at night. I was the late night person at the labs. That worked out well for our family. I still got to see her and worked around her schedule a little bit more when, when she was young. So I don't feel like I missed out on anything and it didn't really hinder anything for school either. So I wouldn't say children are a deterrent to going back to school for ultrasound at all. That's amazing to hear. I hope that um, new moms can hear this and be encouraged to apply to the programs that they want. Absolutely. I think um, it's a fantastic career. Sometimes the work-life balance can be a little bit tricky, especially when you've got call and all of that, but I think anybody can make it work if they want it. That's great. Can you tell us more about your program in general? Like, where did you go? How long was the program? And what degree did you get? So I have an associates in diagnostic medical sonography. The program that I went to offered three concentrations. We had the echo concentration, vascular, and general. 
I originally was in the vascular concentration. So that is what I did, but I also got to double up with the general. Really the only thing that was different between vascular and general was the addition of the OB classes. And at the time I really wanted to make sure that I was marketable. And so I wanted all the information that I could get. So I ended up kind of doing a dual concentration between vascular and general. And it took 18 months in school and then a six month internship afterwards. Yeah, just out. I'm, I'm like counting I'm like, the ones. Wow, too. I know. I was counting the ones. Dang, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yes, yeah, that sounds like an awesome program. Yeah. I'm thinking of your experience, and uh, I'm like, it's really amazing to hear your experience because it's so different from all of us. And I'm, I'm like speechless because. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, what's the most challenging aspect of being? a sonography student and a sonographer now that you've been in the field for over 10 years? I think as a sonography student, it is wrapping your mind around all of the information that we are just throwing at you every single day, every single week, everything, every single semester. Like you are reading, writing, researching, testing, scanning. There's so much to do to learn ultrasound. And I think a lot of people kind of go in and think, well, I'm just gonna take a couple classes and work my way through it. And that's not how a lot of programs are set up. They are full-time programs. So you have to treat it like a full-time job. You are in school to be a sonographer. This job or the program could clear, like easily be a four-year program, but we are jamming it into 18 months. And so you just have to be prepared to put social life on hold. Maybe be prepared to not work as much, uh, be prepared to really put your all into the program. And it's a short 18 months. And when you are done, the rewards are massive. If you can just get through those 18 months, get through your internship and get on to the career, the, the reward is really worth it in the end. If you can just figure that 18 month part out. I definitely agree with that. And obviously that's what I was telling myself through my program was just get through this class, just get through this day. And I'm sure Lynn is feeling that too right now. <laughs> Definitely. I'm just like, I'm getting through a quarter at a time, a class at a time. And then, um, but keeping an end goal in mind, which is to get my uh, license. Exactly. And, you know, working with students, a lot of students are concerned, like, well, how am I going to work through school? How am I going to do this? And I've always kind of presented the question to them, like, is it worth it to you to have to repeat something if you can't get through the semester while working full time or while doing whatever else you need to do? Like, can you take out an extra loan? Not that I encourage going into debt. If you don't have to, don't do it. But, um, you know, try to make school a priority. You have to for this program. It's way too intense to come at it as a casual learner. You have to be prepared to be in your program full time, full hearted. So I would have to ask you because a lot of students um, ask me this and myself have considered, um, is it possible to work full time while in a sonography program? I think that goes back to your support system at home and well, how your program is set up too. I currently teach for a couple of programs that have either evening classes or online classes. And I think that opens you up to being flexible in your learning. But if you are expected to be on campus from nine to five, Monday, through Thursday or something, it's gonna be hard to work full time and find those hours to study and be proficient in your education and dedicate to working. I know people have to do it, so it is possible, but you gotta look at what you can do as a person, like what is your personal situation? Do you have the support system to be able to do that? Or are you gonna jeopardize your education and just draw the whole process out longer than it needs to be? What would you say since you've been you know, teaching students for, you know, a few years now, what has been like the most common struggle that you've seen with students as far as um, in your programs go? Yeah, you know, it's, it's across the board. And I think that really relates back to it's not one personality, it's not one student type that comes into sonography. I really do believe anybody can be successful in a sonography program. Everybody has their strengths and their weaknesses. Some people are really good with the hand-eye coordination they take to scanning, no problem. And some people really struggle with it and they just need that extra practice. They need that extra muscle memory to be built up. Uh, some people then can't sit and take a test or sit in the class and learn all that information that we are going through. 
So it really varies what a person struggles in. And I think it speaks more to the person and their own weaknesses versus across the board struggles. If I had to generalize though, I would probably say understanding the commitment that ultrasound school really is. I think a lot of students are surprised their first semester about what we're actually learning, how the pace goes, how quickly it all is being thrown at them. And that is a hard obstacle to overcome if you're not prepared for it. So to follow up with uh, Giselle's question, um, what advice can you give to current and prospective students um, so that they can be successful in their programs? Before you get into a program, do your research on it. Make sure that the schedule works. Make sure that you're learning what you want to learn. I've seen a lot of posts about like, you know, I really want to do general, but all they're offering is echo. Like if you don't want to do echo or if you don't want to do general, don't. <laughs> don't, don't go into school just to start earning a paycheck. Do it because you want to do the education. Do it because you want to continue this as a career for a while. So that, so do your research. As far as like KHEP accredited versus not accredited, I think that also depends on you as a person. You will make of it what you want. So if you go to a KHEP accredited school, it doesn't mean you're going to graduate. It doesn't mean you're going to get a job. It means that you're getting an education that has been vetted out by another association. If you go to a school that's not accredited, but you put hours and hours of work in, you go to your internship every day like it's an interview, you just wild socks off of them you're probably going to get off of that job at the end of it. So I really think it's um, what you make of your schooling is what what you put into it is really what you're going to get out of it. Yeah. So do, do a little bit of research and be prepared. <laughs> yeah. You brought up a hot topic there, the accredited versus <laughs> non-accredited. One yeah. of the hot topics. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked about it. We've talked about it. <laughs> So we've talked about the challenging aspect. Um, in your experience, what was the best part? What's your most favorite part being a student and, and a sonographer? Uh, as far as being a student, probably the best part, I think, was just the camarader or camaraderie how, of being with other students. Working together, learning together was really interesting, knowing you weren't alone in it. So I really, really encourage people to make those bonds, make those study groups, just be involved with your cohort that you're working with. They're gonna end up being your backbone. They're gonna be there to support you during all those hard times. You guys are gonna be up late studying together. After you guys are done, you're gonna be references for each other too. You never know where your classmates are gonna head out to. And then if you apply for a job, like word of mouth is way better than an application in a random computer system. So if you stay in good terms with your cohort and you know show good work ethic in school, they're gonna remember that. Like, we, you notice what your peers are doing while you're in school. And so, yeah, it just sets up your network. Sonography is such a small world that if you don't build that network in school, it's going to be, it's going to be tough when you get out there. If you have a, what, is it, what do they say? Your, um, now I can't think of it. <laughs> your reputation precedes you. So if you've got a reputation. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's true out there. Mm -hmm. Definitely because, um, we always like say that it's not about like kind of what you know it's who you know almost and it's really important to do your best as a student with your cohort and then in your clinical because you never know who you're going to come across and who can help you and how, what i'm going through in my classes right now are my classmates because no one gets it <laughs> It's tough. The program is tough, despite what many people think of it's easy or not. Um, just to uh, reiterate what Molly said, like all sonography programs are tough. Yeah, and we're and we're all in different places in the United States. So, and you can see that it's all we all still have that similarity of programs being difficult, <laughs> but we all got we all get through it. So that's why we're also like. Yay, we did it. <laughs> oh, Molly, where are you located? I I guess if we're going to go with the city, Minneapolis would be mine. So in between oh. two of you. <laughs> <laughs> so Molly, since you are have you have been in the field for over 10 years, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure the profession has changed a lot in a decade. Have you seen any changes? And if so, what they are since when you started your um, career till now 
and what the outlook is from your opinion and from your like personal experience? You know, sonography in itself, the, the exams that we're doing and the technology itself hasn't changed too much. So that is, I think, a good thing. A lot, you know, there's not a whole lot more to learn currently with the machines. They're trying to put out kind of some new fancy stuff, but we always go back to our B mode, our color, our Doppler, like those are kind of your bread and butter. So as far as like technology changes, like there's cool things that have come out, but they're not mainstays quite yet. And that's more based on radiology and you have to have a radiologist that wants to do cool new fun things. Um, so as far as technology, nothing has changed too much in that sense. I do think the way that we look at patient care has changed a little bit over the years. It does feel like there might be a little bit more red tape that you have to go through a lot more just in case ultrasounds being ordered. Um, so, you know, before it, it felt like there were very legitimate reasons why we were doing a DVT study. And now you'll get a lot of orders that seem a little sus, but you know, that's, it's our job to do them regardless. Uh, so it just, it feels a little bit more stressful. It feels a little bit more, I want same day care. There's a little bit more of a rush to things as well. I think now that, you know, Amazon Prime, you get your packages in two days. Well, I want my medical care in two days as well. So I do feel like there, there's just more of a sense of urgency on everybody's part to get in, get seen, get the results and go, you know, get onto the next test, get onto the next treatment, whatever they need. Uh, recently, a law was passed and this one was kind of, kind of hit a little bit harder more recently, a law was passed that patients now have to have clean, clear access to their medical records. So they need to be able to see that on their patient portal. Basically, all the notes from their doctor's appointments, all the lab results, all need to be available to them very easily. And that really hit ultrasound kind of in a different way than a lot of modalities because our images are now on the internet for patients to see. Our tech reports are on there. And originally that was just communication between us and the radiologist. And we take so much pride in our work and we are responsible to find everything and document everything and label everything. Like it just adds this extra layer of stress to making sure that you are appropriately getting through all of that, not using certain terminology on your tech sheet, not working out of the scope of being a sonographer as well. So that has been what, probably one of the more recent kind of stressful changes that I've seen in the field that we're now just opening up, being a lot more transparent with patients, which I think is a very good thing, but it just adds an extra layer to our jobs. Oh, I actually felt that real hard over here in Vegas. <laughs> I was working for an outpatient place and that had come about. And then it just started this whole thing um, where patients were getting mad about things that we were writing on our tech reports, which are technically things that we always right to kind of back ourselves up. I don't know if for, for students who are listening, if you didn't know ultrasound, we describe what we see, right? And so that's why you're learning all your medical terminology and how to interpret the uh, image. And yes, the radiologist is the one that, you know, diagnoses and stuff, but we actually do look at our images and think about all the anatomy, physiology, and what we're looking at, right? And we describe them and stuff. And so uh, Molly mentions a tech report and we write a report that goes along with the images that we take and we have to describe everything. And we're in communication with the radiologist. In the outpatient place, there was this huge issue of the patients complaining about what we were writing, but it's something we've always done, you know? So that was a huge ordeal out here. I don't know how it is anymore because I'm not working there anymore. But when I was leaving the facilities, that was like a huge problem. Um, and it's just like simple things as far as like, you know, technically difficult study due to bowel gas, which is something that we say all the time. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've seen over there? Uh, it is. So we got some guidance on what we were supposed to start writing on our tech sheets. And it was like, you know, no longer you can no longer write like technically difficult due to patient body habitus. When we were looking at like an ovary that had a hemorrhagic cyst on it, they no longer wanted us to write that on there, which makes sense. It is loosely diagnosing, but it's also describing it as well. <laughs> and so, you know, what they wanted us to write was like a hypochoic mass on the ovary. And I'm like, 
if a patient sees that they're going to see mass, like the second somebody sees mass, they go straight to cancer. Like at least if they Googled hemorrhagic cysts, they'd be able to see it's totally benign and not a big deal. Um, so, you know, some of the guidance that we got was interesting. It was going to be really changing how we communicated with the radiologists. And a lot of us felt like we're done. We're writing measurements and that's about it. <laughs> we're, we're done trying to write anything else. Yeah. And I'm surprised that it's, I mean, I'm sure it's happening all over, but it kind of like, that's a little bit of a change, right? That we're going through and trying to maneuver through that. But after all this time, it sounds like ultrasound still kind of been pretty constant in the medical field. So appreciate your insight with all of that. Yeah, absolutely. It's like so good to speak to you, Molly, about your, like get to pick your brains a little because you've been in the field for 10 years and I'm not in the field yet. And just I was in the field for five years and being an educator, um, I really appreciate you being on here and letting us and like students who are listening, future students who are listening to see like the side of an educator so that like when they're in the program, they can understand what to expect of them and how to be successful in the program. Yeah, I appreciate being able to offer the insight to it. I feel like I could probably go on for days about all of it. (laughs) I don't regret a minute of any of it. It's been an awesome, awesome career. And anybody who's just getting into it, I hope you're excited. Um, take care of yourself. It's a high burnout, high injury career, but if you do it right, you can have longevity in it as well. Yeah. I want to actually bring up that Molly is part of our discord and she's super helpful um, as far as when students ask their questions or even sonographers ask questions in there and she responds and she's very helpful in explaining things. You explain things in such a great way. And that's what I love about um, Molly. She also helps students with physics And that's the one thing that I think that people look at and ultrasound and don't want to get into the field because they think about physics. And I know you're, you're really good at that, at that. So what would you have to say to students who think physics is something that can't get them through this career? I think physics is one of those things that is going to be a challenge for a lot of people, but ultrasound in itself is challenging. So I think it's how you approach this challenge and your reaction to it in the end. So if you go to your physics class, you're studying, you're using your materials, you're asking your teacher questions, using your resources, people and books and internet, you are going to set yourself up more for success with when you apply all of the resources that you have. In the end though, if you go to take your SPI and you fail it and you have to retake it again, is it a big deal? No. Not at all. Not at all. Your path to being registered just is a little different. You had to take your SPI two, three times. Oh, well, you're still going to be a registered tech in the end. Nobody's going to ask you how many times you took that SPI. And if it means you have to go back and learn something again, you've got that much more knowledge because you took that test and went back and could revisit the things that you struggled with. And maybe that's a good thing. If you're not really ready to be registered um, based on physics or based on your boards or whatever, then go back and study it. You're going to get there. Just put the work in. Don't let it stop you because you're afraid of it or don't let it stop you because you failed once. You're going to make mistakes. It's how you react to those mistakes. Did you learn from it or did you just let it shut you down? So don't be afraid of physics. There are people out there to help you. Your teachers want to help you. They want to talk to you about physics. Um, Use them as your resource and just go get it. You can do it. Yes, use them and use Molly because I notice when she answers students' messages or questions on Discord, the way she explains those questions is so easy to understand. So if you haven't joined the Discord, contact yourself, join, ask Molly questions. And I believe, Molly, you have a YouTube as well, right? Um, I do. (laughs) (laughs) do. Um, It's uh, I have a I have a couple actually. Um, my original one started out with DMS instructors, and that was just kind of a landing spot for all of my education material that I was using for my college courses. So there are physics lectures out there that go over the whole gamut of physics. And then I did start another YouTube channel, which is a little bit more branded and a little bit more refined, I would say. Um, so that's Sano Nerds on YouTube. So mostly focusing on physics and abdomen right now. That's awesome. I really think that 
channels like yours super duperly help everybody that's in the program. Even for me being a sonographer, I still look at these things and I still look at other people's like posts on Instagram and I see the community growing and it's really helpful. And I just love that everyone's here for each other. And I definitely thank you for everything that you put out there because it takes a lot to do those videos. It is a lot of work to do the content, but I enjoy it. Like that's probably one of my favorite parts about teaching is building the content and redoing it and finding the pictures and drawing things out for people. And I just get, I get a lot of messages uh, through email and comments. They're like, this was so helpful. This, you know, this saved me. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's warm fuzzies and it makes it worth it. I and mean, it's, it's fun. Yeah. And I love that we do this um, just because we love helping others and educating and you're just a very special human and I appreciate you for doing everything that you do and for coming on here and talking with everybody today. Well, thank you. I appreciate those kind words that you have and I think you've built an amazing community and uh, it's really neat to see all the students come in and all the positivity that's in that discord. So it's fun. It is. Thank you so much. Do you have any last minute advice that you want to give to students and incoming uh, future sonographers out there? Um, oh, last minute advice. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say no, because nothing's coming to mind, but. Um... <laughs> or like any qualities <laughs> that students should have to be successful. You know, I thought about that question a little bit and I thought, you know, I don't want to paint a box around who a sonographer is. There are so many personalities that come into the field and are successful with it. You know, a big thing that drew me to the field was that I needed something that was engaging, that let me learn every day, that let me wear a lot of hats. So, you know, you're doing admin, then you're doing press, then you're doing a thyroid, then you're doing babies, and then like three pelvics in a row. And then you're back to legs or something. And I love that it was just a whole bunch of variety for it. And like, and there was technology and art and science and computers. And like, there's just so many facets to ultrasound. So like that really fit me as a personality thing of what I was looking for in a career. But you don't have to be overly outgoing. You can be a complete introvert. Both are going to be successful. I've worked with people that are like hugging their patients and crying with them on the way out because they've just become best friends or I'm a little bit quieter when I scan. I don't do a whole lot of talking because I'm really focused on what I'm doing. So I think if you want to do this and you put the time and effort into it, I think anybody really can be successful in sonography and will find the right place for them in the end. That is very well said. I agree. <laughs> I work with some sonographers who actually like don't really like to talk to their patients. And honestly, some people are afraid to go into the field because of the bed care experience. But sometimes that's just how it goes. You know, that doesn't mean they're a bad sonographer because they can't talk to their patient. And you learn coping mechanisms with that as well. I mean, you, you have to be prepared to take care of sick people. Like mm -hmm. you're not just always going to have people that can walk in, lay down on your bed and hold their breath for you and do all of that for you. You are going to have very sick people. You're looking for disease. You're looking for pathology that is causing their symptoms. And sometimes that pathology is life-threatening and we need to be prepared to find it and deal with it and document it appropriately. That being said though, a majority of our patients are fine. They're coming in for very minor issues and we're going to still treat them with respect and care for them. But kind of to circle back the coping part of it. Like I teach my students, if you can't talk while you're doing it, find spots that you can talk. Like when we're doing legs, I say at the knee, check in on your patient. How are you doing? Doing okay? Are you comfortable? You're switching positions. You're kind of rearranging how you're holding the transducer at that point. It's a good break in your mind and a good time to check on your patient because you're about halfway through your leg. Uh, same idea with abdomen. Like when you ask them to roll for their gallbladder pictures, I use their name and say, all right, John, I'm going to have you roll over. Uh, how are you doing? Still comfortable? It's just find those moments where you're kind of shifting gears and use that moment to have a quick conversation <laughs> and then you can get back to what you're doing. The patient will still feel cared for and you can still kind of get through without having to talk too much. <laughs> Thank you for that good tip. I will use that in my clinicals now. <laughs> <laughs> or I was going to say the other big thing that I try to do is look at the newspaper, listen to the radio, state fair coming up, um, big holiday weekends ask them a very open-ended question. And usually if it's a type of person that wants to talk, they'll just talk <laughs> while you scan. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's best case scenario. <laughs> right. There's like two, there's two types of patients. The one that'll keep on talking and want to talk. And then the other one that just doesn't want to talk. <laughs> or the one that just sleeps yeah. very comfortably. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
But yeah, I definitely appreciate uh, you coming on to everybody who's listening. I hope you guys found some insight from this episode and just know that uh, this community is here for you guys. If you guys have any questions, you know, we're always here for you. And uh, I definitely appreciate Molly bringing in her experience of being a sonographer for over 10 years. So thank you. You are very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. So if you guys uh, don't forget to rate us wherever you listen to us, I know we're all over on different types of platforms, but the one platform that means a lot is the Apple podcast where you can rate us five stars and write a review on there. So we'd appreciate if you guys did that for us. Yes. And you can always reach out to us on Instagrams and YouTubes. Uh, Giselle is LL Giselle on both platforms i'm dms diaries on instagram and molly is on sono nerds on youtube yeah so thank you guys so much for listening and molly thank you so much for being here thank you my pleasure all right you guys we'll see you or talk to you next week yes bye bye (laughs) the end we did it yay Yay. how do you feel was it for you molly i felt like i talked too much i'm sorry <laughs> oh, no, feel, that's the whole point that's the whole point of it i mean we feel that on. we feel like 30 minutes isn't enough to keep on talk keep on talking we want to talk about everything but like you know attention yeah, attention <laughs> yeah. oh, i wanted to ask you what's your favorite case but then we ran out of time <laughs> <laughs> I know. but i feel like you have so many cases um oh gosh yeah there's- you can say it for the youtube Yes, you can say for YouTube though. You Please tell YouTube. us your like most memorable case. The one that well, you people t- t- them come to mind, and of course they're all like more recent ones. I'm trying to think of like <laughs> it's super interesting over the years, but I know people always ask me, and I'm like, I really don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> they're all there's yeah, there's so many times that I've come across something and they've all been interesting for different reasons, like, well, we've never seen that before, or mm-hmm. wow, that was a good catch not to toot my own horn or anything, but like, oh, that was a good catch. Um, <laughs> so, or yeah, so I don't know. Um, I think probably the one that surprised me the most was this patient had, she was a hundred, I think. And she was coming in for abdominal pain, I believe. And I put the transducer down and there is like this giant 10 centimeter mass, like solid mass right in the middle of her abdomen. I was like, okay. So I'm just kind of scanning around it and working through it. And she's like, did you measure my pancreas yet? I'm like, why would I want to measure your pancreas? And she's like, oh, I've got a mass on it. I'm like, oh, uh (laughs) uh-huh. Tell me more. And she's like, she's 100. So back when she was 40, they were like, yeah, there was this mass, but they didn't think it'd be a big deal. And I think it measured like maybe like a couple centimeters at that time. And I was like, well, you've got like a tennis ball in you now, baseball or softball. And yeah, it was just funny. She's like, they probably didn't expect me to live to a hundred though either. <laughs> Maybe Aww. not. So um, yeah, she had this huge mass. Her gall- her common bile duct, I think was like 17 millimeters, something ginormous. Oh my and gosh. it was, yeah, it was just kind of interesting. It's just always kind of funny. Like when patients don't really fill you in on everything or like their medical history is a little sketchy and the EMR and you go in, you're like, okay, there's a massive something in here. And then they're like, Hey, did you see that yet? And you're like, okay, everybody knows about this. Everybody knows about this. <laughs> I don't have to run out of here screaming. Like we've got a big one. <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. She's a hundred. Oh, it's cute. She's like, have oh, you seen my pancreas yet? <laughs> <laughs> they don't expect me to live this long. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that was, and I was like, well, yeah, you had another 60 years to let this benign growth just keep growing. Most people would have only had like another 40 maybe. So wow. yeah, so that, that one was interesting. Um, you know, I've had a lot of cancers, a lot of, you know, making plans for next summer and it's clearly met mm. all over the liver kind of stuff. Um, making plans to go somewhere and it's endometrial hyperplasia and it looks cancerous like a lot of that stuff comes to mind because that's a lot of that's really common it's common stuff that we find and so it's hard when you see that and you're trying to keep your poker face on and keep the conversation going without sobbing in the middle of your exam but I always told students you know they're like well how do you deal with it how do you find what do you do when you find something I'm like well you have to stay calm stop take a breath 
and be logical about it because if you stop and like start getting all nervous and taking random pictures or like throw the transducer down and run out of the room, then you're not helping the patient. So, you know, in the moment you might be a little taken aback, just get your pictures. You got to get them done and documented as best as you can. So I think a lot of people, like I, I know when I was in school, one of my biggest fears was I'm going to put the transducer down and baby's not going to have a heartbeat. Like that was like my biggest fear. And it still kind of is my biggest fear. I kind of hold my breath until I see it. I'm like, okay, it's going to be a good scan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when it's not, it, you know, we just, you learn from your preceptors, you learn from your clinical instructors about how to deal with it. And you'll, if you have good guidance, you'll know how to deal with it when the time comes. Oh yeah. Cause we do definitely see a lot of like abnormal stuff. And that's why when people ask me, I'm always like, oh, all the interesting cases are usually abnormal. <laughs> like that's what you're not supposed to find anything. <laughs> I mean, I remember my, like one of my first ones that I thought I was like super shocked about was when I saw situs and verses on a baby. And that I, I always go back to that one just because I think that's so crazy to have all your organs on the other side. And you're just like, oh, what's happening? <laughs> right? Everything's, everything's confusing. <laughs> I know that um, Lynn's doing echoes and vascular. So it's like completely different types of abnormalities for you guys to see. But whenever in the echo chat and they're like posting all their pictures, I'm like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I love echo um I'm in the vascular lab right now and I remember oh I completed my first protocol which is uh, segmental pressure so ankle brachial index so it's really cool yeah I did it yesterday um but I remember the first time that they let me fly solo and my preceptor just assisted it um the patient was he he was like in his late 40s um a fistula on the left arm an amputee, so uh, left leg was amputated, and right big toe was amputated. So she let me flew solo, and I was like, I know what I'm doing. And then I, when I got to the toe, I'm like, he doesn't have a toe. <laughs> like, <laughs> which one? Do, what do I do? So she's like, oh, you can just go to the second toe. And then she was like, okay, now his uh, get his brachial pressure on his left arm. I'm like, okay. And she's like, oh wait, no, he has the fistula, so you do, you don't need to do that. And I was just like, uh, uh. <laughs> and he had like bandages everywhere. So I had to like maneuver around it. It was, I, I won't forget it <laughs> for now. <laughs> the joy of vascular care. It's a lot when, especially when they're very symptomatic and have diabetes and all the bandages and the fistulas mm -hmm. and amputated toes. And it's, it's an interesting, interesting field on the vascular side. Yes. It is definitely. I'm like every day I see something new. Lynn, you are in clinicals right now while you go to school. You guys do them at the yes. same time. Very yes, cool. I have classes, labs, and clinicals. Okay. So today I have classes and labs. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's why I wake up at 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Giselle. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I know that's crazy. Wait, so Minneapolis, 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 is it Minneapolis? Minneapolis. <laughs> well, I, I, Minneapolis. Yeah, Minneapolis. they're they're CST. They're in the middle, right? CST. Your your P Central. Yeah, so you're two central. two hours behind and one Are you, hour before. So Midwest is what you would say. Yes. Yep. Okay. So we're we're an hour behind New York and two hours ahead of uh -huh. Pacific. Oh, I guess so it's not too early for you. Okay, I'm glad. No, it's no, now children in the house. 